Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this week's podcast, the Multifamily Podcast with me, Charles Dobbins. You're the multifamily attorney and your host for this session. And in this session, this should be a, a, a very fun session. Uh, this is I want you all to meet Steve Rosenberg. Steve uh, and I spoke uh, a, a while back uh, when he was in a hotel room and uh, uh, late at night. He had to kick out all the dancing girls. Uh, and then uh, and then he um, uh, he had me and, and we, we talked about his business. And he's such an interesting guy that um, I, and I had such a great time talking with him. I wished I had recorded the call. It was one of those things where you just wait. I mean, cause Steve, I think you even said that afterwards. It's yeah. like, uh, I wish I, cause we were going off on everything. So I figured let's Steve, let's just repeat the magic. Okay. There let's you just, go. you know, turn it on. Now you, you get this, I, you know, of course <clears throat> I get these bios of everybody and Steve's got a phenomenal bio. And we're going to get dig into it a little bit more, but I want to talk first off because, because there's something in his bio that just, Oh man, it's so true. And when I see this, I I know that that Steve's a real deal. Is he wrote a book, Building an Empire, Failing Our Way to Millions book. And I gotta tell you, that is if when I look at some of these gurus out there right now who have never, as I say, gone through a cycle or have never had the opportunity to fail, their advice is useless. I mean, unless you've been through it, you're, you, you don't know what it's like to be uh, truly successful. So, Steve, welcome aboard. Thanks, man. I appreciate uh, you have me. And you're right. We, uh, if we would have recorded last time, it, there were some gold nuggets there. That <laughs> we're hopefully so we can good. find them again, you know? Yes, exactly. I mean, first of what we always did, and I got to tell you, like, I got another podcast I got I to gotta record right after this one with another pilot. It just, it just never fails. I just, I don't know what they, what they, what is it? Is it, I attract them or they're just attracted to this business? You know, I, I don't know what it is. It's probably, and it's not an or it's probably, yeah, it's probably true. Food. <laughs> yep, that's true. That's true. It's not mutually exclusive. So uh, Steve, tell us about, uh, I, I want to hear uh, for starters, because this is, this t ties all into your real estate is your, uh, your piloting career. Like how, how, you know, when, when did it start for you? Sure. Uh, well, I, uh, you know, growing up, I grew up born and raised in Los Angeles and uh, didn't know anything about flying, didn't know anyone in the flying world. I just remember as a little kid looking up in the sky and thinking, man, how, how does that happen? Like, how do we even, how do we, how, where do those things go? How do you do that? It's just yeah. that, that weird, you know, thing. And I just kind of started, you know, going forward in that path and learning about it and realizing, okay, those guys in the front are called pilots, not bus drivers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they have a career doing that and people do that. But, as a but I bet you, I bet you, let me ask you some now do the pilots call themselves bus drivers? Some do, some do, yeah, uh, yeah. uh, aluminum tube engineers, uh, yeah, okay. is terminology. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, as a young age, I was, I was into sports and I was very, uh, very aggressive in, in, in sports and getting things done. Uh, and I basically, when I left playing football, I kind of took that same tenacity and I, and I basically attacked the whole flying concept. Um, and without knowing any better, I didn't know anyone. And it's one of those things that, you know, you don't know what you can't do until someone says you can't do that. And, and I was a prime example of that because by the time I was 20, uh, I believe I was 20 years old, I had gotten hired with my first uh, airline. Really? And, Tw yeah. Two zero? Two zero. It was it was a commuter airline, so it was called a regional back then. I don't know what the term was, oh, yeah. but we were flying the 30, 30, 40 passenger planes. But it was a, it was a scheduled airline. Yeah. Uh, it was a, a subsidiary of uh, TWA Airlines. Just to give you a, a dating fact of, of how old I was. Hey, uh, I had I had dinner last night with an Eastern Airlines pilot. Okay. Like so, that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So uh, I worked for uh, TWA Express, is what it was called. I worked okay. there. And I was no, wait, so, hold on. You were 20. So were you in college, out of college, or did you not go to college? Uh, I was going concurrently, actually. Okay. And so okay. what happened was, is I ended up, maybe I was 21. I'm trying to remember the dates. But what happened was, is I was going to school at the same time getting my hours. And normally what happens yeah. is, is people will get their hours and then they, or they'll get their degree and then they get their hours. Yeah. I was like, well, why not just do it at the same time? Like yeah. that's stupid. So I started doing it at the same time. I was going after it. I ended up getting hired before I finished my degree. So I went, got hired with TWA Express. I was flying out of St. Louis. Um, and then what I did is I went back to college through correspondence and I finished my degree through correspondence. Um, I was actually too young to even upgrade to captain. You had to be 23 and a slot came open that I could take it, but I was 22. And to get your ATP license, your airline transport pilot license, you have to be 23 years old. So I had the hours, I had everything, but I wasn't old enough. 
Yeah. And I, it still didn't register with me. I was still like, well, I'll just keep working. I'll just keep doing my deal because that was a stepping stone job to get something else. And so yeah. um, ended up at 25 years old, uh, ended up getting another job at the at, at then Continental Airlines. Um, I was the second youngest person hired with them. Um, and uh, I was kind of off to the races. And it's funny because when I got there, I had a bunch of, you know, older senior guys, you know, you fly with them and they're like, how old are you? And I said, oh, I'm 25. And they said, my son's 25 or 26. Yeah. And I said, oh, what is it? What does your son do? He's like, he's a DJ. And yeah. Yeah. He's like, what, 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 you know? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I just, you know, how do you do, how'd you do that? Cause the average age was 35 to get hired. That was a national yeah. average. So anyway, so, um, I was flying, had the best job in the world. I, I loved it to death. I went to Guam. I was flying out in the South Pacific, was flying all over Australia, Asia. I mean, just really just soaking it all in newly married. My wife and I are out there. And um, it, was, it was the best job in the world. That's all I ever wanted to do. And I remember specifically one day telling my wife, I don't understand why all these pilots have these side gigs. Like, I would never want a side gig. Like, that seems so dumb. Like, this is the pinnacle of what you want. Why would you want to do something else? And that held true until September 11th. Okay. That, folks, listen up. This is, this is where the story gets really interesting. Go ahead. So I always tell people on September 10th, I had the best, most safe, secure job in the world. Yep. On September 13th, 72 hours later, that all got turned upside Isn't down. that amazing? And uh, if people need to hear that who are sitting there thinking they, they're, you know, they, they've got a nice, safe, secure job. It can all be gone tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I was uh, given a furlough notice basically saying, hey, thanks for playing, but we don't think we're going to need you anymore because we're going to do some restructuring. Um, and basically I was told that I'm one of 1200 guys that will be put on the street along with about a hundred thousand other airline pilots all over the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, kind of good luck. And so I realized, and, and again, when you're, when you're in an industry that, uh, let's say it's oil or the stocks or something where you see a trend, right? You can see it coming. It's kind of like this hurricane that's coming up the coastline. You could see it coming. Well, when you have something like nine 11, which hopefully no one ever has to deal with again, it's like ripping off a Band-Aid. And it was all of a sudden this safe, secure airline career that they say you can't ever lose your job, you're part of a union, you're this or that, to saying, hey, you know what, sorry, um, not only are we giving you a furlough notice, but all the pilots that um, are flying, we're going to go ahead and abrogate those contracts and we're going to void your uh, pensions and your retirements and we'll do what we have to do to keep the company solvent. And so all of a sudden, I, you know, this is really a matter of weeks. And so for me, September 13th was my kind of day of reckoning that I talked yeah. about in my book. And it was the day that I realized that that safe, secure job was anything but. It actually was an illusion. Yeah. Um, because until you've, like you said earlier, until you walk that walk and until you've actually felt that feeling of going, what could I do? And I remember looking in the want ads to go, okay, well, I'll just get a job. And I realized I actually wasn't qualified to do anything else. I couldn't even drive a truck because I didn't have a commercial license. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah. I could fly this $100 million airplane around the world, but I, I'm really useless. So I'm so specialized that I'm useless to the rest of the world, basically, is what it was. You know, that's like, that's like having a law degree and not being able to teach high school. Yeah, yeah, exa exactly. Well, yeah. You're going to be kidding me. It's very yeah. humbling, you know, and anyone that's been in that position, you, you feel very vulnerable and you feel very humbled to go like, wow, like this whole dream that I thought I had you know, obviously if 9-11 never happened, maybe I never would have gone down this path, but um, I, you realize like, wow, this was, this was an illusion. Like, you know, I'm not a big conspiracy theory of, oh, maybe they want everybody to be employees or this, that, but I just realized like, I did this to myself. Like I, mm -hmm. I actually, I caused this on my own by stop. I, I stopped learning and I stopped trying to be better just because I got a job. You and, didn't realize that you were actually working for Steve Rosenberg Incorporated. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Very true. Yep. So, um, so what I did is I, I started really doing some soul searching and figuring out, okay, what, what would I do? And now luckily I came within 30 from the bottom of losing my job. I was hanging on by a thread. So I was at, based out of New York. I was sitting on reserve in this crash pad, or, you know, try, waiting for a flight. And it was just, it was a dark, I mean, you want to talk about dark days, man, this was bad. And, but, but you realize like, okay, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I did this to myself. Okay, that's fine. I can fix this because I'm one of those guys that I just get it done. And so I really started to sit there and go, okay, what could I do? And I'm, trying, I, Steve, I'm just trying to think to myself, who are the other 29 guys? I think they all were like over 75 years old. Those are the guys you were competing against, you know, well, they're young bucks. 
against you know, old guys. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is is the uh, it's all about seniority in the airlines, right? It's also yeah. it's all seniority, and then when things go bad, it's reverse seniority. And what happened was is I've had a couple buddy of mine, uh, one buddy of mine that he actually took the class behind me because he said, "Oh, go ahead and take my slot. I'm going on vacation with my family." And I was always taught, "Take the first chance you get. Take that job." So I'm like, "I'll take it." Wow. So I took that slot. He didn't. He ended up being on the street for about two and a half years because he didn't take advantage. And I ran into him a couple of years later and he ended up coming back and getting a job at, you know, 2005, 2006. And I looked at him, I didn't say a thing. And he goes, don't even say it. He said, oh. don't even say it. I said, I'm not saying nothing, man. Was, you know, you know what I mean? He's like, I don't even want to hear it, man. He knew, he knew. He knew. Oh, that, was a, that was a lesson for him, you know. Oh, um, man. So I, I started learning about, you know, everybody was tied to wealth towards real estate is basically what I found. And what I started realizing was if I want to be wealthy and I want to have some sort of passive income or something that I could be leveraged out on, everything tied towards real estate. So I was like, okay. So I started reading about real estate and really trying to understand it because up until this point in my life, all I ever knew was flying. And you get that feeling, and I don't know if you or the listeners ever had that feeling, but I felt like I was like, I felt like I got into the, the game at the fifth inning and I had to catch up. And all of a sudden I realized that I was so far behind the curve that for me to do this, I had to just full throttle and I had to just push through this as hard as I could because but Steve, how old were you then? I was 29. Yeah, I was 29. Gosh, geez. But you was, know, again, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? You, yeah. you all of a sudden, you know that behind you, the, the road is crumbling or potentially could crumble. Yeah. If nine 11 happened again or any hiccup. And if you remember that time frame, we had the SARS, we had foot and mouth disease. We had oil prices. I mean, we, we would joke that maybe the locusts were just going to come and pick up the plane and take us off because it was like that, that many bad things were happening in the airline industry and yeah. airlines, if you remember, airlines were going out of business left yeah. and right. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a bad time. Um, so I started reading like a book a week on real estate. And I just, I just was, was ferocious in trying to understand because it was like this new society that, that basically I felt like I walked through a looking glass and all of a sudden I was realizing like, wow, all these terms and words and all these like gurus. And I was just very, you know, trying to understand my footing of where I was and what I would do. And uh, so I, I learned a lot about real estate. I, I really took a long time to educate, but I'm one of those ready, shoot, aim kind of guys. And I was like, I'm doing something. I don't care what it is, but I'm, this thing's getting on the highway. And so I, I learned how to wholesale. And for those that don't know what wholesaling is, basically I would find a, I, I would do option contracts where I had a buyer. Uh, I would get, I'm sorry, I'd get a seller that would want to sell their property, a buyer that wanted to buy the property. I'd put them together and, and basically make the spread in between. Um, through a lot of negotiating and stuff. And I got where, really- Where were you doing that? You're, you said LA, you were- um, LA. I'm sorry, yeah, I was doing this in Houston. So I was living in oh, Houston okay, at okay. the time. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and Houston was a very dry, kind of very stale market. Appreciation was about 3%. So there was a lot of people that couldn't sell their home. So, you know, this is about 2004, 2005-ish. And all of a sudden you start seeing, um, you know, California, New York, Phoenix, just going through the roof. And Houston's just steady, right? Yeah. Just steady climbing. And so I would find motivated sellers and I would, you know, put them, you know, I'd buy, get an option on it and I would get a uh, motivated or a buyer, an investor buyer and put them together. And I did very well. I learned, I took a lot of classes on learning how to negotiate and I really, really honed my craft on learning how to present, how to speak, how to negotiate. And I learned a lot of the, the inner working dynamics of real estate. And it, it proved very fruitful for me and I, and I was very successful at this business model. Well, I say it's a business model. It really wasn't a business. It was a job because as soon as I stopped, the business stopped. Yeah. So I realized that, okay, yes, I am making good money doing this, but this is a job and this, this is not what I wanted. Um, so I joined a local investment group. Um, I was really big into educating, getting educated, and I learned about apartments. And so I ended up partnering with a guy uh, who's my business partner still to this day. And we went in partnership on a 39 or 40 unit apartment complex in Houston. Um, and that was kind of how I got into that realm. And what's funny is, is it's the grassroots greener theory. He wanted to learn what I was doing because I was making a lot of fast money. I wanted to learn what he was doing because he was building wealth. Yeah, and it's, yeah. he, he thought what I did was cool. And, and I thought the same. Um, go ahead. What were you asking? Well, no, I, it, it, 
I'm sure you've heard all of it, they're everywhere. Than Merrill's commercials on, uh, you, know, uh, you know, hey, I'm coming to your city where, where my formula is going to work great for you, where you can, you know, find homes, flip them, and then buy income producing property to grow true wealth. I'm like, Than, wait, wait a minute here, Than. Why aren't you just telling people to come to me? I'll teach them how to buy, how to buy the apartments. And he, like, he just sells, he sells my own program. So I got yeah. to call Than and thank him for that. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Get, get a little, get a little, get kick him down with something actually yeah. for funneling him. Um, He's a good guy. So, so basically, what I did is that then I started learning about multifamily, um, and that that morphed into um, you know just really getting consumed and understanding that world. Which you know, uh, again, my uh, my history in that industry in that world is I tell people, you know, I talk to a lot of people and they say I want to get into multifamily. I want to do this now. This is before the syndications and stuff was really. That, that word, I don't even think it existed. I think that was more of a mafia thing back then. But um, what I tell people is, is, you know, with multi- You're family, right. You know, and, and no one knew that word. Now it's, the, yeah. now it's this big buzzword. But back then, uh, it was like, part, it was called partnerships. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is, just so, just so you know, if I want to have a webinar and have a thousand people show up, I just have to put the word syndication in the title. And yeah. boom, everybody yeah. shows up. Exactly. Yep. And what I tell people is, you know, yes, there's a great side to apartment complex. It works very well. However... When you add those at zeros on the front side, sometimes you got to add them to the negative side, meaning the losses. Yeah. And there's, there's a dark side to it. And, and I know a lot of people that have really been hurt badly. My, my business partner, he had, a, um, he had one foreclose on. Oh, I'm, I'm, hey, I want to talk about going through the cycle. I've lost them. I've lost yeah. them. And, yeah. and this is what makes me, I think, a better teacher is because I tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep. And I, I like... There's one guy out there that I just want to, uh, this guy will be brought before the SEC because he always says you can overpay for multifamily property because the values just keep going up on them. I'm, I, I never mentioned his name, but everybody knows exactly who I'm talking about. And pay me to show you how to do it. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or invest in my deals. And I'm thinking to myself, that guy must be seven years old because yeah. he didn't live through the last cycle because I'll tell you right now, I've I had two properties that never came back up in value in time, and and I had to drop the keys on the bank's desk. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, it wasn't a pretty sight, but that's that's why I teach my students. Uh, you know, you know, you gotta you gotta watch, you gotta make sure that the financials are sound. Yep, yep. You know? and, and again, it's just one of those. I tell people, I go, look, you're playing in a different sandbox with uh, people that you know. You're a sophisticated investor now, and you know, I'm not not to go down this story, but but you know, like I tell people, like. Just don't, don't, don't go for the flash and the hype of what people are telling you. Make sure you understand what you're getting into because like everything, there's a dark side to every industry yep. and you've got to make sure that you understand the, the sandbox you're in, there's glass in there. Yeah. And if you're not wearing shoes, you will cut your feet. And yeah. it, sometimes it could you know, be very, very dangerous. And, and again, I've seen people lose everything that they own. Now, I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money. Yep. Um, yep. And, and you know, it can definitely be done without a doubt. But I've also seen people that don't know what they're doing. They don't take the time. They rush into syndications or, or partnerships. And, you know, mm -hmm. now it's toxic. And, you know, no one ever talks about that side. Like, you know, my oh, book, I talk oh, about all my failures and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, you know, let me just tell you, everything you're saying is spot on. And, and we, my wife and I used to work for one particular guru who, when my wife got up on stage with him, uh, she said, you know, multifamily is a hard business. He pulled her aside afterwards and said, don't ever tell my audience that this is a hard business. We're like, whoa, you know what? You, you talk about toxic that, that don't yeah. ever tell us not to do that because you got to tell the truth. You got to like, let everybody know this is a business. All Absolutely. business is hard. Absolutely. And you know, I'll tell you, it's the greatest business I've ever been in. Uh, I would not want to be in any other business, but it's a business. Yeah. You got to watch it. These people who think they can just put it on remote control and, you know, no tennis toilets or trash to travel to Haiti and tennis and, tennis and, 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 you know, put, you know, put their feet up on the ottoman. It does. You will lose your business in 90 days. If that's your approach. I yeah, guarantee. I, you. I tell people all the time what, you know, we get um, in the, in the property management business that I own, you know, I'll get investors that, you know, they see me speaking and I speak around the world on, and on property management and on investing and stuff. So, you know, they, they kind of know me so they can associate because they, they see me. I'm a trusted individual in their eyes. Yeah. Um, and so they'll say like, oh, I just want to hand you the property and I don't even want to think about it. And I tell them that could be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why? Like, what do you mean? I go, you are the, you own a business. You are the CEO of that business. Do you know any CEO that just puts his head in the sand exactly. and ignores the data? I said, you trust, but verify. I said, yeah. we are the operating system of your business. 
you should be trusting, but you should be verifying everything that we do because if not, you will be fired. And the way that you get fired, Mr. Owner, is you lose your investment and you yeah. lose all your money. Yeah. And so I tell them, I go, do not ever trust anyone blindly. You don't know me. You don't know my business. Yeah, I mean, obviously I've got good r record and all that stuff, but you don't know me. You don't know if my business model matches your business model. Then they'll say, well, I don't have a business model. And I go, well, that may be the first problem we have to conquer because right now you don't even understand that you're running a business. And that's why most landlords, you know, end up in some form of lawsuit or litigation um, because of that. You know, Steve, I, you just said something right now that not one hour ago did I say to one of my clients who's thinking about getting into a partnership, and that is don't trust anybody. I said, here's a rule. I say this to everybody. Don't trust anybody. And I had one student say to me, but Charlie, you're telling us not to trust you. And I said, my rule has no exception. Don't right. trust anybody. And I said, listen, that, that sounds so jaded and sounds like I've got a negative uh, opinion of life. It's just that I've been beat up enough times to know that, hey, listen, we'll, we'll work together, but we're going to verify everything. And, you know, I'm not going to take your word for it. I want to see those, those numbers. I want to see the money in my bank account because yep. that's, that's the only way you can verify it. But don't trust anything anyone tells you. Get everything in writing. Fences Absolutely. make good neighbors and contracts are fences. It's funny. One of the things I tell people, I've, I've, I do a lot of podcasts. And the last one, I was on a big, uh, Bigger Pockets podcast. And yeah, yeah. I've just had tons I've of- never, I've never heard of those guys, Steve. I've yeah, well, it's, it's especially yeah. B, B, Bigger. Uh, and so I, um, uh, I've had a lot of people reaching out to me, asking me about advice and coaching and this and that. And so I'm talking to this guy this weekend and he's a pilot and he's like, hey, you know, um, can, you, can you give me some advice and this and that? And, and he's like, I'm, I'm, I want to get into multifamily in Indianapolis and these areas. And I said, oh, I said, so have you, what do you own in those areas? And he's like, oh, I don't own anything. And I'm like, okay. I said, so are you partnering with someone in that area? No, me and my childhood buddy are going to partner. I said, let me ask you this. I said, have you guys talked about the divorce? Yeah. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, the divorce. He says, well, I don't understand what you mean. He goes, well, we're, we're good friends. I said, that's the reason that you have to talk about the divorce. You have to, you have to air the dirty laundry before it happens and yeah. say, if the, you know, if I have to put in, if we each have to put in $50,000 and you tell me, Hey, I, I've got a family. I can't do that now. Now, what do you do? What, what yeah. does he lose the equity position? What happens? I said, because that's the reality of these partnerships. And I go, you're, you're doing it to save the friendship. Actually. I said, the reality is, is that if you, if somebody gets offended because you put a, you want to talk about what happens if we don't get along, what happens for this or that, and they get offended, are they really, I mean, that's the, that's the, the, that's the least of your problems when you have all of your life savings on the line and now you're making emotional decisions because this guy wants to go off and get married and doesn't have the money to put in for a new roof that you have to pay for. You know, yeah. that's, those are yeah. the conversations you have to have. And I tell people, it's, it's, you know, if you don't want to do that, don't partner. I said, because that's, that's the reason. You know, one of my, I, I take my old life insurance, uh, you know, training to some of these conversations where uh, a guy says, oh, I'm partnering with my brother. All right. So how does the arrangement work? What's the structure of the arrangement? He goes, it's my brother. I don't, I mean, it's, we're going to split everything 50, 50. I said, no, no. What do you have in writing? It's my brother. I don't need anything to write. No, no. Here's the problem. The problem is not going to be with your brother. The problem is going to be with your brother's widow's next husband. Yep. He doesn't like you. Yeah. And he wants his share of the pie. What's the agreement? And yeah. that's when you put it in, the, in real life context like that, people start to understand, geez, ooh, maybe, I, maybe I should think about this a little bit more. So absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so fast forward, I'm sorry, we got a little sidetrack. Oh, this is great. Are you kidding me? This is fantastic. Yes. I mean, this is like a, a Seth Rogen or not Seth Rogen. Who's, who's a guy? Joe Rogan. Who is it? Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. Like yeah. his, his, his podcast go on for like four hours. I mean, yeah. was, Hey, I don't care. We can talk forever. I got no, yeah. I'm not going to run out of tape. That's the beautiful things about these things. I've got plenty of film. So anyway, so what we ended up doing was, is we sold that apartment complex. We exited, uh, had a good, great exit on, on that deal. Um, which by the way, that is one of the biggest reasons I, I always say investors fail is because they never, two reasons. Number one, they never set their goals of where they're going and what their destination is. And number two, they never ever think about their exit strategy. Yeah. No investor ever thinks about an exit and they go, I'm just going to have them forever. I'm like, well, that is an exit. Dying with your properties is an exit, but then yeah. what? And, yeah. and no one ever talks about the exit, the, the, the exit of the, the deal. But anyways, um, so we exited the deal, um, did really well. The church next door actually bought it for us cash. Um, which we're, yeah, we're very lucky. Uh, they needed a parking lot and, uh, 
We gave it, we gave them an empty building and uh, they, they I love cash. non I love nonprofits with cash. I know. It's yeah, always, yeah. yeah. It's funny because the economy was crashing. This is like in 2007, 2008, when everything was in turmoil and yeah. they had already given us non-refundable option money. And uh, we were kind of like, you know, I wonder if they're still going to move forward. So we talked to the church and we're like, you know, you guys still moving forward? They're like, oh yeah, we got the cash. We're fine. Of course. Unbelievable. Yep. Governments, schools, hospitals, and churches. Yeah. yeah. Proof. The economy yep. doesn't bother us. It doesn't affect us. Nah, 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 nah. We got God on our side, son. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm going to pray on it. Anyways, <laughs> uh, so we ended up, uh, so the worst thing that happened now was, and this what I told you about problem number one and problem number two. I know that because this is where I lived that problem is we're flush with cash and we think that we are the smartest guys in the world yep. and nothing can go wrong. And call we decide that the, we're, we call that the Joe Biden syndrome. Go yeah. On. Oh yeah. So we decide that we're going to get into the single family world because now we just conquered the multifamily single families easy. We're going to go ahead and dominate. So my business partner says, Hey man, I found these great deals. Uh, there, there, there's tons of them out there. We can get them from pennies on the dollar. They're going to make 50, 60% cash on cash return. These are just, gonna, we're just, these are home runs all the way. And I said, okay. I said, what, what are they? He goes, well, they're called low income, high cash flow properties. And I'm like, uh, okay, let's, why, why one? Let's get as many as we can. So we get about 20 of these things uh, in about a year. And um, we, uh, next thing we know, we have these people that start calling us and wanting things. And uh, those people are called tenants. Yeah. And they want to, now we don't have an apartment manager. Now it's he and I running this and we have maintenance problems. And, and, and it's just one after the other and the other. And our average tenancy is about eight months. And our make ready costs are three times the amount because the tenants, when they leave, they seem to like to take parting gifts with they them. Like it. I'm wiring, electrical, copper, uh, toilets, ceiling fans. So they would, you know, basically take those parting gifts with them when they left. So we'd have the shell of a property that we'd have to go ahead. And it was just, it was this vicious cycle. And in our infinite wisdom, um, we felt the only way, the only way to solve this problem was to buy more. Yeah. <laughs> sure. You know, we're losing money every day, but we're going to make it up on volume. Exactly. Yep. yep. So we buy about another 15 of these things. So now we're about 35 deep into these uh, we'll call them bad, yes, we'll call uh, them yeah. properties. And uh, our, our world just our world just collapses on us. I mean, it was a it was a bad way, and so we really were in a bad way. And finally, my wife was the one who said, "You know what? You suck at buying houses. You need to stop. Like you are no good at this." And I kept thinking I could fix this. I kept thinking like I I can fix this if I keep. I, I got to figure this out. Like it was a. Yeah. I, I I wouldn't. I refused to give up. And she's like, "No, you can't. Like you, what you are doing is not working." Okay, let, let me just stop right here because what this is, your wife is brilliant because at some point, entrepreneurs have to say, I'm really not three feet from gold. I, I, you know, this is, I'm doing something wrong here. Let's take a step back and, and, and try something new because it's not always going to work out, you know, with, um, you know, uh, all uh, plover. But, but I'll tell you, uh, this is fantastic because there are so many times in our development that I wish that I wish I had your wife looking over my shoulder, telling me the yeah. exact same thing. Yeah. And so we basically sat down and realized, okay, we, we've got three options. The first option is sell them all. Second option is turn them over to a management company. Third option is self-manage them, fix it ourselves. Um, we really didn't want to self-manage them because I was you know, You were doing that already, weren't you? Well, we were, well, we were, but we were doing it emotionally. We weren't running it like a business. We were, oh, we, okay, we were okay. doing it. We, we were just, point. it was kind of a side problem for yeah. us that we would hope that it would go away. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Where, yeah. Um, the, the option of selling them wasn't going to happen because this is about 2010, 2011 where nobody could get a loan. Um, so that wasn't going to happen. And my business partner says, I'll tell you what, he goes, let me call. Especially down in Houston. Yeah. It, it just, it just yeah. wasn't happening. And, and again, these are low income houses. So these are, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 homes. So, you yeah. know, you're not, no lenders want to lend on them anyways. Yeah, especially um, that time. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we end up, my business partner says, Hey, I'm going to make some phone calls. Let me see if I can get some management companies. Okay. So he calls me up a week later. He's like, we got a problem. I'm like, did we buy another house? And I don't know about it. Cause <laughs> my wife, my wife actually told me, she goes, if you buy another one, it better be nice. Cause you're going to be living in it. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my God, am I moving? Like what happened? He goes, nobody wants them. I'm like, what do you mean nobody wants them? He goes, yeah. nobody, nobody. He goes all the okay. management companies said, we're not going to make money on them. They're too much work. And, and basically, they would put us out of business quicker than we did it ourselves. And I'm thinking, well, we're doing a pretty good job on our own, but okay. Um, and you so know. we're stuck. 
Yeah, I'll tell you, this is, this is a lesson for new multifamily owners who are looking at the C-class properties oh. in the war zones. Management companies don't want to touch them. I mean, no. they don't make any money. They're, they're so, it requires such active management that they don't make any money in those types of properties. That's why you see those C-class properties being uh, self-managed because yep. nobody else will touch them. Yep, so exactly. Excellent point. Excellent yeah. point. And, and just point, case in point here, my business partner uh, at the time, he was the lead investor on a D. I'm talking D, heavy D, like, like, like bold D. Um, complex in Houston, 52 units in uh, third ward of Houston that he was a lead investor. And let me tell you something, anybody that you read my book, I talk about this because we started managing the company out of there just to keep an eye on his complex. Yeah. And you want to talk about a war zone and you want to talk about the school of hard knocks, man. The bell you know, was a session for us on that deal. You know what the problem was with your partner? He wasn't married to your wife. <laughs> yeah, well, his, he had his own challenges on his side as far as being told that he was a moron. So we both, we both were being told very quickly that we don't know what we're doing. But um, Well, you know, you know what? I got to tell you, uh, you don't know, probably don't know this about me, but I, I have a bumper sticker on my car. It says, life is too short to own C-class property. Okay? Uh, and so when you're talking D, uh, why? I mean, We're, we're it, talking like three fifty a month, all bills paid. Oh, I mean, you're, you're talking- I mean, boiler, flat roof. Uh, yeah. Yeah, built duplexes. in there were, there were there were twenty six duplexes basically yeah. as a, as a, being sold as a thing. Anyways, it's in my hey, book. Listen, here's, let, let me. Here's a rule: don't buy a property that Section Eight won't rent to. Yeah, very good point. Uh, there, there was a, there was there's many many lessons there that I could I mean exactly. I could do a tour of that place. Which it's funny now we actually when people come work for our company we give them a tour of that complex. Well, we windows up, doors locked, but we'll give them a tour yeah, of that company, yeah. that apartment complex to show them. Look, this is where we started. Like this is this is where we operate. Up now we're in an A class building, all that. But uh, um, so, anyways, what we ended up doing was is we we sat down and we said, okay, we can do this if we sell if we figure this out. And so he and I sat down. And we basically understood that we need to create some policies, some procedures, some structure to look at it as a third party company. And we did that for about six months. We plumbed this company, which is the, the, the blueprint of what we own today. But one of the best things we did is, well, we started managing them. Things started going good and we had other people approach us to manage their properties. And one of the first things we did is we went to a business coach and we asked the business coach, do we have something here? Because we didn't want to go down that path again. Yeah. And he says, well, you have marketability, you have opportunity, and you have scalability. So by definition, yes, you have a business. You guys are not the smartest guys in the world. And based on what your track record is, you'll probably go out of business in six months. So if you want to do this, you can, but you need someone guiding you. So of course, he was the best closer because he closed us. And we ended up hiring him as a coach that day. Uh, we couldn't afford to have them, but we couldn't afford not to have them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was, that was December, that was June 1 of 2012. G uh, June 1, December 1 of 2012, my business partner quit his job. We hired our first full-time employee. Oh, that's We so were cool. basically off to the races. And what we've done since then is we've uh, grown to a thousand single family properties managing in three cities, wow. Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, we bring in about 1.6 million a month in rent. We manage about 160 million in assets. Um, and the only way that we've done this, which I know we're kind of going towards, <clears throat> is we had to understand how to secure leverage and how to understand that, how to automate as much as possible and understand the right person, right seat model. And okay. the, yeah. So you've got, you're probably charging close to 10%, probably close to 10%. Yep. So you're bringing in about a million bucks, you know, million, million some odd uh, and change uh, per month. No, I'm sorry. Uh, no, but 130,000 per month uh, of, of revenue to your company. You're still flying. Still flying. Still flying. So, uh, so yeah, still flying. Uh, my business partner, he's in it full time. Um, but what we have learned is the power of leverage and the power of team. Yeah, and yeah, we, we yeah. I, I'm a big believer in you systematize 80%, you humanize 20%. And I, we took that to the nth degree. Um, we're very big in understanding leverage and understanding using the right person in the right seat. Okay. Um, one of the first things we did when we were growing our company was we created an organization chart. So for those of you who don't know, it's, it's basically the, the blueprint of how your company looks. But what we also did is we created an organization chart of how our company looks the day that we sell it. 
and what that looks like to us. And so now we have a map of where we're at and we have a map of where we're going. And because we had those two maps, we would start to grow the company more proactively than reactively. And so when we're looking to hire or do a role, we're able to look at the positions of the company and go, okay, that is the next logical hire. We're not hiring here just because we have a fire going. Is that a person problem or a system problem? Um, and, and one thing that I've learned, and, and you probably as well, is that as you're growing a company, your systems break and your people break. It's just how it is. And yeah. that's the reality of it. Because when we were at 100 properties, we had a much different challenges than we had at 500 properties as we did at 800. And things constantly break. And our job as leaders is not doing the work. Our jobs as leaders is finding those bottlenecks and looking at it on the business, not in the business. And I think that the challenge is a lot of entrepreneurs, they get involved in this industry as operators and they never have an understanding of how to get on top of the business to look at it from that 10,000, 30,000 foot view to understand that their job is not, their best skill set is not doing, it's thinking and it's growing. And so we took that skill set and we honed it. We had to learn it. I mean, look, you're not, you know, I tell people like, you know, you're not born a leader, you become a leader. You, we don't hire good employees, we make and breed good employees because of our culture, because of our core values, because of what we believe in. Um, and, and so we're able to take our model, the way we're able to scale this is, is um, we took my, my learnings from being an airline pilot with checklists and systemization. I've been trained by Boeing for the last 23 years on how to use a checklist, which they're probably, airline industry is probably the benchmark for checklist and systemization. Um, and we're able to take that model and use checklists and systems and roles and scale that out um, with the use of virtual assistants in other countries um, so that we can bring our price point down. Um, because if you, as you grow a company, if, if people don't realize this, they will, that your, your payroll and your expenses could actually eat you up before your profit can get on top. And that, that, was a, that was a big lesson for us that we had to learn that, okay, you know, because again, they don't teach you this as you're growing. You think you're going to grow a company. And as you bring in more revenue, the profit goes up. Well, that's not always the case. And all of a sudden you start having challenges with team and employees and performance and those kind of things. And the only way that we could do this is why KPIs, metrics, and scalability through virtual assistance, which is what we've done to, to scale our business to what we are today. Define KPI. <clears throat> KPI is a key performance indicator. It's basically the report card of how that role is doing. So every department in my company has a metric and a KPI, um, and it's either whatever is a problem with that role or something that we want to keep an eye on. And it could be three to five things. It's not a lot. Um, you don't want to over bombard it, but it's things that I want to look at. For example, my maintenance team that is, is in Mexico, um, and we want to know how many service tickets come in um, that are still there after seven days. How many service tickets are denied? How many, service, how many vendors did not show on time? So we get about, right now we're getting about 900 service tickets a month. It's a lot of service tickets. I only want to know about the problems. I don't care if they're showing up on time. I don't care. I want to know the ones that are the red. And so what we do is we make them conditional. Green is good. Red is bad. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at red because I want the overview to go, why is that red two weeks in a row? Do we have a system problem or do we have a person problem or vendor problem? And that's how I can look at it from that bird's eye perspective. That's fantastic. And that's how you, that's how you build it. And this, it all comes together. Uh, it just, this is a great story as to how business needs to be run as far as I love the checklists. You know, when you talk about the, the problem becoming, it, it, uh, are you an operator or are you the entrepreneur? It's like it gets back to Michael Gerber's e-myth. You know, yep. you're, you're an, an entrepreneur, you're a manager, or you're a technician. And the problem is that most of, of in, including in my students, now that, you know, and this is what we're going to be talking about uh, in, in just a moment, is how do you go from, you know, building your business uh, so that you can, you can scale it and you can step away from it? And that's where you have to come up with these systems in, in place. I mean, I have them in my business, but I got to tell you something, Steve. Oh, you're making me think that, oh, I got to, I got to, you know, tighten up my KPIs. I got to tighten up my, uh, my systems here. Um, so let's, let's talk more about that. You came along and, uh, you know, one of the cool things is that you see opportunity in so many different places. I think your business coach probably helped you do that. Where Absolutely. You, you, yeah. Where you see like, Hey, this is a business. And then from that business, you've now created another business. So tell me, you know, you're down there in Houston. 
Um, you talk about Mexico. Uh, you know, I, I, I heard you're the third largest employer in Mexico right now. <laughs> I don't know about that, but we're, well, we're in one town we're, you are in one town. Yeah. We're, we're doing pretty well. So yeah. So what, what we ended up realizing was, you know, we, we had, look, virtual assistance is nothing new, right? Using a, using a VA, it, it's not a new concept. We used a lot of virtual assistants and we, we went through Asia and India and all that. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. But the challenge that we ran into and most real estate people run into is that <clears throat> virtual assistants, the Asian, the Asian uh, community, if you will, the culture is their very submissive culture. And so the challenge that we had with that was that, with this industry, this, has, this is a very pivotal industry in real estate when things are going on and have to, it has to happen where you don't really get that as much in the Asian culture. We couldn't find that, I'll say. Maybe it does exist, but we couldn't find it. And so, go ahead. That's really interesting you say that because I use a, an Asian VA and it always blows me away how nice she is to me. Yes, yeah. I'm not, I'm not used to that. I mean, I'm, I'm from Boston. I mean, I mean come on. I mean, I mean, treat me like a lady type of thing. yeah. And, you know, yeah. And geez, they're always, they're always so nice to me, sending me like all the, you know, uh, cards and then somebody in their family gets sick and I, I send over like a get that's, well. Yeah, yep, yep. That's, that's the, co that's common. And so, and I, and I lived, I lived in the Philippines for a while when I was working for the airline. So I, I actually got to understand a little more of the culture than most people would. Um, but what, the one thing I'll say is when we started going down to Mexico is there was a couple of reasons why we really liked it is number one, basically same side of the world. Okay. So the yeah. time zone challenge doesn't exist because, you know, they're working on the backside of the clock. I don't care what everyone says. When you're working on the backside of the clock and you have an employee, it's either you have to wait a day to get something. And then if yeah. it's not right, you got to send it back. Yeah. The, the language barrier is a challenge when it comes to just how we pronunciate words and yeah. also how we spell certain words, which as we know, whenever a client, a forward facing client is getting something that has a mistake, Chink in your armor, whether it's a tenant, whether it's a contractor, whether it's a, a banker or a social media, it doesn't matter. And so we were always trying to overcome that. Well, what we found is, is when we started using virtual assistants is 50% of them actually grew up in the United States or lived here at some point in their life. Yeah. So them coming up to, to go into the Miami uh, heat game is not uncommon for them. They go to Vegas. I mean, they're just, you know, uh, we have got a couple that were, one was an agent in Los Angeles and they moved down there maybe to go with family or it's just so expensive. They can't afford it. Um, so it's not the same as most people think. The other thing I realized is that a lot of the virtual assistants that we have, um, they came from very, very good jobs, Nissan, Oracle, AT&T. One guy we actually interviewed, this was interesting. I said, what did you do before this? And he says, oh, I, I was a 911 dispatcher. And I said, I, I didn't know Mexico had 911. And he said, they don't. And I said, well, who were you for? He said, Texas. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when you call 911 in Texas, it goes to, it goes to us. I said, well, then what happens? He goes, well, then we render first aid and we call the appropriate authority. That's when I realized, okay, these people can, they can pivot. They get it. They understand it. But not only really that, cool. yeah. So then what we started doing, so we basically, we just doubled down. We 10 X this thing. So we actually shipped our phones down there. You just right? said the magic, you just said the magic word, Steve. I'm waiting for like the, I'm waiting for the Groucho Marx uh, duck to <laughs> drop down and you win a hundred dollars when you said 10 X. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you can see right there. I'm a huge 10 X fan. Uh yeah. Do you know who I was talking about when I said you, you can pay, you can overpay for a multifamily property because the prices just keep going up? No, I don't. Yeah, you do. Oh, okay, I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna go down that road. But uh, so um, all good, all good. We're all, all you know, ingest. Uh, so what what we realized is number one, they can do things much better than than I could as long as you give them systems and you give them the right tools. They can actually, so I'll fast forward, you know, we use them to contact our vendors. They contact our owners. They contact our tenants. So we use them for maintenance control. We use them for leasing. We use them for all inbound leads and sales, social media. I mean, basically 60% of our operation is being done in Mexico. What's interesting about this, what people don't realize is I said, I said it earlier, and I don't know if, if, if your listeners caught it, we were able to take our payroll costs we were about 59% payroll to revenue. We actually got that down to 30% or 30. I think we're at 33% now. So you can do the math for a, a company that's doing the numbers that we're doing. That's a lot of money. And we actually have more staff 
than any other management company probably in the US and our payroll costs are less. So we know that we are able to provide a better service. And I mean, like I said, if you look us up online, we have about 580 Google reviews. A lot of those reviews are by our team down south because they get the reviews because of how good they work. And we use them for move out coordinator, move in, move in, move out inspection, leasing. They do all document preparation. They do CMA now. So, I mean, they, they do everything that could be a phone or data. If it doesn't physically require a license or physically require someone to be there, it can be outsourced. The biggest challenge that most people have is number one, it shines a light on the weakness of their own business model because they don't have the documentation and they go, you know what? That's okay. I'll just do it myself. Well, that's just them going and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to just kind of, you know, uh, the Superman hero thing. But the reality is, is if you got hit by a bus tomorrow, who's going to step in and run your business? And if you don't have documentation and you can't walk away, you don't have a business, you have a job. And that's, yeah. that's the reality. A lot of us don't want to accept. And they think we, we think we're covering it up by saying, I just like being in the business or I like this or nobody could sell as good as me. Let me tell you something. They can without a doubt. Yep. Yep. That is amazing. Okay. So and the 60% of, the, of your workforce is down there in Mexico directing probably 30% of the other workforce up here in the States. Like absolutely the people in the States get their marching orders from somebody in Mexico. Yeah. I've got a, a buddy of mine. He, we had placed about eight virtual assistants with him. He's in California. And at first he thought he wouldn't even need one. He says, well, maybe I'll, I'll take one and see how it goes. I'm like, okay, whatever. He has eight now. And one of them is the basically running the whole operations and he's making fractional compared to what his employees in California are making. And this guy down in Mexico is actually running the whole operation. And he's like, he just laughs at it. He's like, I cannot believe how, how smooth this works. He's like, I'm just, uh -huh. I'm in awe of the, it, you know, it's, I hate to say it. It's the work ethic and the fact that they care. That, that to yeah. me is the biggest difference because we, and I don't know if, you know, maybe it's different in Boston or wherever, but we were just always having a challenge finding people who just seem to care. And that's yeah. all we want. You know, as, a, as an owner of a business, you know, when you want to give good service and you can't even get your employees to show up on yeah. time or call yeah. people back, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's very detrimental to your uh, personal sanity, let's say. I tell you, when I had, I had 35 employees working for me in my own insurance business, I, I was ready to kill myself. You know, it was, just, I, I just don't want to work the way. So let's, let's put this, uh, you know, in the context of, you know, multifamily investors and setting up the business the right way and outsourcing things that they, that can be outsourced and worked with on by a, by a VA. So sure. how do, I mean, we're talking about obviously the marketing uh, of your business, uh, reaching out to investors, um, you know, generating new investor leads, finding the property, speaking to the owners, doing the marketing on that side. How does a VA, how would a VA come into play with all of that? Well, I'll tell you what, what if I walk you through our cycle of how we do yeah. it and then yeah. people in the multifamily can, can understand because, you know, multifamily, single family, it doesn't matter. It's all the same, right? It's, 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 all it is is taking right. care of customers, right. taking so care of customers. I'll just, I'll just clue you in on how we do it. So we get a lead that comes in. We get about close to 200 leads a month that come in either through electronically or whatever the case may be. Um, those go into our CRM system, okay? As soon as they get into our CRM system, that goes to Mexico. Mexico gets it. So we have team, we have, we have teams. Um, so the, the investor services division team will get that lead and they will reach out to that lead. They have within five minutes, we want them reaching out. So it's boom, it's there, right? They're calling that lead back. They talk to the lead. They define based on our qualifications, is it a lead or is it someone that doesn't even know the word real estate, right? Because that's a definition you got to understand. Yeah. If it's a lead, they get the, they get the basic questions asked for, answered from them. And then what they do is they will set up an appointment for the salesperson to meet that person. So what they do is they get all the information. They look on the salesperson's calendar and they say, oh, okay, well, Megan is available tomorrow at 9 a.m. Let me go ahead and set an appointment for you at 9 a.m. And, and Megan can meet you. So Megan has still not talked to this person, right? So now what happens is, is they go in, they create the management agreement, they create the CMA analysis, any other pertinent information they take, they load all of that into the uh, profile of the CRM system. Megan is still not talked to this person. Megan wakes up the next morning and says, oh, I've got five appointments today. 
all the information is loaded in the calendar linked to the CM to the mm -hmm. CRM profile. She before she goes, she looks at it, she prints the agreement, prints the CMA analysis, puts it all together, walks in the door, hopefully closes the deal. Let's say she closes the deal. She brings it back, she scans it, sends it back to Mexico. Mexico takes it, they slice that agreement up, they load it all into the CRM profile, they load it into the property management software, loading all the specifics, you know, how much is the rent, how much is the agreement, all that stuff. Load all that information, then they do an onboarding with the owner. So they onboard the owner. Okay, we just wanna make sure we're all aware this is gonna be the price, this is this, this is that. All basic questions they go yeah. over to make sure the documentation in the software is taken care of. <clears throat> then from there, they get pushed over to operations. Operations takes them, still in Mexico, they take them and they basically make sure, okay, is there a tenant? Is there a tenant lease? They send the welcome packet to the tenant, they call the tenant, hi, we're so-and-so, we're the management company, we're gonna be taking over the property, blah, blah, blah. So they do all of that stuff. So when you think about this, these are all minutes which lead to hours that are saved because our team in stateside still has never done anything. They load everything up. Any maintenance issue that is done with this property is all handled in, in um, Mexico. So we use a system called Property Meld. That's a system that the uh, tenants can talk to the vendors and it's all coordinated on our side. Mexico handles that. They, if there's an issue with the property, they contact the owner, they tell the owner the situation, they coordinate with the tenant, they make it all work, owner pays the bill, it then goes to accounting, which is in Mexico, that's taken care of there. So the property manager still has not really gotten to the mix. Why? Because I, again, call it the 80-20 rule, which is 80% of the stuff that comes into your business or comes into your life, it's white noise. I'm not saying it's not important. It has to be addressed, but it doesn't have to be addressed by you. But yeah. somebody has to do it. So if I have a property manager and they have 100 emails, 80 of them are wastes of time, 20 of them are important. One of those 20 could be a lawsuit, could be another lead to do more business. It could be something important, but they never get to it. Why? Because they're buried going through the, how do I log into my portal? Why do I have to pay my rent on time? What is this violation notice? We have a tenant relations team down there that handles all that. I don't want my property managers that are making X dollars a year doing $5 an hour work. It just, it doesn't make sense, right? It's not right person, right tea. Because I can have now, instead of a property manager managing 150 properties, I can now have a property manager managing 400 properties with the offloading of certain tasks. Yeah. So yeah. leasing, leasing applications, all of that is done. Now, when I say accounting, the accounting is done down there, but they don't hit enter. It, they, that, that's done up here. But they, they do owner ledgers, tenant ledgers, any billing discrepancy, all that's done down there. If it's a level two, meaning more serious, then it gets kicked up to, uh, to headquarters. But now, again, just, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, Steve. No, I'm just saying, it, to me, it's all the mindset of what is the best use of everyone's time. Yeah. And it's all about, you know, I don't want to burn out my accountant constantly going over this when that's not what I'm paying him for. I, yeah. I don't, I don't want to pay this guy all this money to be going over a, a ledger with the tenant because they don't know how to log in and pay their rent. That's yeah. not a good use. Now what, uh, you know, you talk about this from the property management standpoint, but you've been branching out, haven't you? And using, uh, you know, the VA business for other types of customers as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We've been, we've been, um, you know, when you start really understanding leverage and right person, right seat, it opens up a whole window. So, I mean, I've got people at, at you know, we've got some, some, um, uh, what do we say? Uh, people that, that do subcontracting work for Microsoft. Um, we uh, recently partnered with a, a, a friend of mine uh, that has a staffing company, a national staffing company. And this is a, this is a strategic add-on car businesses. Um, you know, you just want someone to answer your phone and do your stuff. I've got one. She's my personal assistant. You want to talk about, Hey, can you go ahead and book my flight? Can you go ahead, can you, can you um, clear my calendar? Can you make sure all these emails are answered? You wanna talk about freeing up your time because what, what I'll say is it's not industry specific, it's time specific. The two biggest resistances people have over anything is time and money. Well, you've alleviated both of these by alleviating your time and by lowering the cost point of this that you're able to think more clearly because what people don't realize is a five minute phone call, five minute interruption is actually equal to 23 minutes of lost time. Yeah, I was just gonna say 20 minutes. Yeah, 23. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I see that all the time. Now, 
so if someone were to come to you, I guess one of the best things that you would do for somebody is force them to take a look at their business and yes. really start to map out what can be outsourced. Or, and, and by doing that, you have to create the systems yourself, which I'm, I'm sure many new investors never have done. Yeah, they, they haven't done, and, and, and that's okay, but it, it gets them thinking. And a lot yeah. of times when I talk to, you know, investors and I, and I help them, I'm like, look, you know, you, you got to build this for winter, man. You got to build this for long haul. Don't build this because you're, you're energetic and, and you're excited right now. You've got to build this to last years and months yeah. and, and, and years and years and decades. And the only way you can do that is build that bridge. You got to build that foundation. You got to take the time sharpen that mental act and you really got to think about what is your business? What is your business model? And if you got hit by a bus, how does it keep operating? Yeah. And the key is, you know, again, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I think it has been about two and a half weeks since the last time I've been in my office. Does that give you any clue? <laughs> well, I'd be afraid. I'd be afraid if, if it were me yeah. to walk in after two and a half weeks. I mean, obviously I bring my laptop everywhere I go, but, yeah, that's fantastic. I, I didn't say I didn't say I was I didn't say I was ignorant to it. I've got yeah. I've got KPIs. Yeah, we have metrics. Yep. So I, we're I'm I'm trying to be the leader, but let the team do what they do. Yep. Um, and you know, one of the biggest challenges I've found with with owners of businesses is they don't hold themselves accountable. And I and I've done a lot of speaking presentations uh, for this. And I when I talk about accountability, I ask people. I say, so do you do you want your team to be accountable? Do you want your team to show up on time? And every of course they say yes. And I say okay. How are you accountable? Who do you report to? Because just because you're the boss doesn't mean that you aren't accountable to people. Yeah. And they're kind of like, I never thought about that. I'm like, well, if you show up late to meetings or you don't do what you're supposed to do, how can you expect anyone else to? Because the fish stinks from the head down. And yeah. if you're not doing those things and you're not accountable, don't expect anyone else to. And if you don't understand leverage, how are you going to leverage your business? You know, being busy doesn't mean you're moving forward. You know, don't, don't, people mistake busyness for forward movement. They're not related at all. We all, look, you and I have been very busy at times and go, at the end of the day, you go, man, I don't know what I did today. I'm just busy. Yeah. I didn't do anything. Yeah. And that's, that's because they're, they're not being a leader. They're being a doer. And being a doer, you know, and that, that's why I've learned that, you know, having team, understanding virtual assistants, understanding how they are so, so vital and the thing is, is here's what I tell people. We all use computers. We use phones. We use apps. We use this. This is the same. A virtual assistant is the same thing. And if people don't realize that, they are going to be basically marketed out of the business because other people can operate at a much lower price point and have their expenses much lower than someone who's trying to have full staff and do it themselves. And it's just not scalable. You know, when you say uh, some people are just doers, the, and sometimes that is a cover for the fact that they just want to remain in their comfort zone. Absolutely. And they don't want to like branch out and they think, hey, I'm just, I'm, hey, I work today. I work today. But you didn't yep. move the business forward. Yep. And as, as a leader, that's your role is to move Absolutely. the business forward. You know, so man, that's fantastic. Okay, Steve, how do we get a hold of you? What, what, you know, what's your website? How do we find out more about, about the VA business? Sure. Um, well, uh, they can go to my website, steverosenberg.com, R O Z E N B E R G. <clears throat> um, oh, I am Z E N Z the Z not the yes. Rosenberg of the not the other one the famous <laughs> Rosenberg not the other one no um, I'm all over social media you can find me on Facebook Steve Rosenberg professional um, Rosenberg Steve on Instagram um, you can just set people want to know they can send me an email direct um, my email is Steve at Empire Industries LLC dot com. Um, and what I do is basically, uh, we'll do a diagnostic and really see what, where the challenges are in your business. And, you know, again, I, I, I want to help people and we do place yeah. them for all industries. Um, what we do works well, uh, because it's simple. I don't overcomplicate things. You know, this is, this is a very simple model, but it's a very successful model and it's been working for a long time. We've just kind of taken that thing and really made it more usable and user friendly for people in our industry, I think. I think just even talking with you and, and forcing, uh, you know, a customer to have to break down the steps in his business on, on everything that he does in the course of a day and what can be uh, itemized and systematized and shipped off is huge. Absolutely. Absolutely huge. I yeah. mean, I love how you've done it on the property management side. Man, I tell you, um, oh, that's, that's good stuff. Very good yeah. stuff. 
So it's, it's, it's a mindset. It's a mindset shift. You know, and I tell people is. the biggest roadblock with virtual assistants is normally you. That's normally the biggest roadblock is you yeah. not accepting the fact that, you know, that, that the world has changed. It's not the old way of doing things. And yeah. I don't know if you know this, but the, the day that that all changed, can, well, I'll ask you, do you know when society changed that the international walls came down and all of a sudden India, do you know when that actually, actually happened? Um, I'm going to say after the crash, after the last real estate crash is my guess, but go ahead. Tell it to me. Uh, when the Berlin wall came down, really? that was when international, all of a sudden that opened up the world. Think about it. When the Berlin yeah. wall came down, that those are the indicators that that is when international basically became international. And all of a sudden that was a precursor. I mean, that was the start. It wasn't a tidal wave, but that's what actually started it yeah. was opening up the world. And so people that are in the old age and the old way of thinking, think about that. They're, you know, just be, I mean, look, we're, you're in Boston, I'm in Texas. I mean, I, last time I was where, I was in London when we were talking, Yeah. think yeah. about that. So we can use technology for this, but we don't want to use it for staffing. That's an old way of thinking. And that's, that's not going to last. You know, I'll tell you, that's really true because you look at things like Fiverr and, and Upwork and, you know, all those things. I mean, I was dealing with guys in Croatia. Yeah. I, I mean. I, I had to read Pat Buchanan's book, uh, you know, uh, Hitler, Churchill, and the Unnecessary War before I understood where the hell Croatia even was. You know, yeah. and here I am now working with somebody in Croatia. It's amazing to me. You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. So it's um, just, again, it's just something to think about that, I, I'm, it, you know, people that are trying to buy an apartment complex are going to be like, I don't, I don't even, they probably don't even know what the Berlin Wall was, as sad as that is. Uh, but, but, you know. Hey, he, they don't know who Don Rickles is either. I'll tell you that right now. Johnny Carson. Uh, exactly. Uh, Eddie McMahon. Jay Leno. Do they even know who Jay Leno is? I'll go with that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Can you yeah. imagine that? Jeez. Yeah. Or oh, 411. God. I talked to my son. I'm like, hey, 411. He's like, what's that? I'm like, it's the Google of today. He's like, oh. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because I just used that expression the other, the other, the other day. I said, "Hey, what's the four one one?" And I thought to myself, "Geez, I wonder if my kids even know what that means." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. But but you think of how technology is moving, and so that's what I tell people. I'm like, if you're not moving with technology, it's not going to stop or slow down. Yeah, yeah, you know, you can't do things with the old way of business. And leveraging staff and leveraging team is the way to do it. And there's no yeah. way that we would be able to grow our company and be as successful as we are. Had we not done that route. And the thing is, and this is one of the things that, that I think is, is key, is that you've done this while you're still doing your other job. Absolutely. That's just, that's point. That's, I mean, look, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I yeah. understand leverage. Yeah. And I, you don't have to agree with me, by the way. But anyways. Um, no. <laughs> <I'm tall. laughs> uh, but, yeah, you're really I not, actually. Really yeah. Not, not, yeah. No, yeah. But, and I'm tall. And I'm tall, yeah. too. Good, yeah. like, gotta be good looking, yeah, too. Yeah, just ask yeah. me. Uh, but you know, I tell people, I'm like, look, it can be done. I don't have this magic formula. I wasn't, I didn't go to this great business school. I mean, I learned from hard knocks, but yeah. I learned those lessons and, and look, take my lessons. Don't repeat them. Just learn from them and, and go with it, you know? And that, that's kind of what I would tell your listeners is, you know, understand what you have, you know, what you do with helping people. That's great. You know, take the advice from people that are doing it. Not the people, like you said, not the gurus that have never done it. Talk to the people that have had the failures. And like I said, yeah. if you read my book, you'll read all my failures. I mean, they're there. I mean, they're awesome. very, very clear, you know? I only want to deal with people who have failed. Absolutely. You know, that's, Absolutely. that's, that's the key. So, hey, his name is Steve Rosenberg. He's a good guy. And, uh, you know, check out his book. I, you know, I, if, you, if you're wondering how to build a great business, you have to learn how to fail first. But also yep. check out his, uh, uh, this whole concept of the VA guys. Uh, if you're looking to build your own business while you're doing your other thing, which I, I highly recommend, these people who burn the ships and jump into multifamily, never doing it before, ugh, that's a scary prospect. But you've got to build a system that you can turn on and turn off and walk away from and still runs. And, uh, hey, Steve's a pro at it. So, uh, you know, and I, they finally found something that he was good at. Because he's still trying <laughs> Not to many. Out. It's rare. <laughs> still trying to figure out what the flaps are for. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, Steve. Hey, it was great seeing you again. And this is, again, once again, a lot of fun. I can't wait to meet you face to face. And uh, you. You know, we'll have a lot of fun. So. Thanks so much for being on the Multifamily Podcast, and we will see you soon. Thanks, Thanks. Steve. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.